the one and only Buzz Aldrin. Well, that concludes the Apollo historic section of our broadcast. I hope you enjoyed the exclusive never before seen interview with Dr. Colonel Buzz Aldrin. And we hope you enjoyed the Apollo panel. You know, Cyan, I once emceed an Apollo panel myself at Space Fest a few years ago. And it, it, was, it really was one of the highlights of, of my career. I had nine Apollo astronauts on stage and Rick Armstrong. And I had them at my mercy for 90 whole minutes. And I spent a long time preparing questions that I thought and hoped they'd never been asked before. And the highlight of the panel for me was as follows. I said, gentlemen, I'm gonna ask you a question, an unusual question. And when you hear this question, I don't want you to think about it. I want an instantaneous gut reaction. And if you feel the answer to this question is yes, I want you to just raise your right hand. And so the question was this. Gentlemen of Apollo, do you think, yes or no, that somewhere in the universe, there is some form of life. And all but one instantly put their hands up. I'm not gonna tell you which one it was <laughs> who didn't put his hand up. So ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Nine out of 10 <laughs> Apollo astronauts believe the answer to is there extraterrestrial life is yes. Well, you know, it's funny you bring that up because I actually do believe that there is extraterrestrial life out there somewhere and the way I came to that conclusion was because I was on a TV show called Genius by Stephen Hawking. So with Stephen Hawking, he wanted to know whether or not he could get me to think like a genius and understand the processes of how we go about finding exoplanets and life in the universe. And so I won't tell you whether I passed or not when it came <laughs> <No> to... No <laughs> pressure. Stephen Hawking asks if you're a genius. Yes right, no. exactly. But the nice thing is that um, there are people out there that are actually looking for exoplanets, but not just exoplanets, but life on those planets. And one of those people is Dr. Sarah Seeger. And she is an astrophysicist and planetary scientist at MIT. And what she does is that she looks for biosignatures in the atmosphere of exoplanets. <laughs> Mind blown, right? Because we're looking at not only finding a planet out there, but how do you know it's so far away that there is life? And so then you got to think about, well, is there anything in the atmosphere that would enable you to, to determine this. And that's what she does her research on. She is literally looking for Earth's twin out there among billions of stars. And so let's hear from Sarah. Hi everybody, I'm Professor Sarah Seeger from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I'm here not in this gorgeous northern night, but I'm actually in my home with this background of the stars because I wanted to start by sharing with you or reminding you that every star is a sun. And if our sun has planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, etc., surely those other stars should have planets also, and they do. And actually, we know of thousands of planets orbiting other stars. In our night sky, if you have great eyesight and are in a super dark sight, you could see maybe a thousand stars. But our galaxy, the Milky Way, has hundreds of billions of stars. And in our universe, there are hundreds of billions of galaxies. So the number of planets out there is just unbelievable. And we're hoping that some of them have life on it. We're hoping that some of the planets have life on them and that the life breathes out gases that can accumulate in the atmosphere that someday we might be able to detect with our telescopes. Now we'd only be able to detect planets and signs of life in their atmospheres around the very, very nearest stars. And all of that is what I'm going to tell you about today. So what I'm going to start with So my title is Exoplanets and the Search for New Worlds. And I'm going to start by talking to you about the TESS mission. 
TESS stands for Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Now on April 18th, 2018, we had a spectacular launch. The day was so crystal clear, and that rocket had the brightest plume I've ever seen. And right inside the tippy top of that rocket is, or was rather, a telescope uh, called TESS. And this telescope actually is not very big. Here it is while it was still being worked on um, in the clean room at Northrop Grumman. And you can see people there for size. And what you can see um, are the solar panels. Those are the most obvious thing out to the side. Those were deployed, uh, stowed for launch, and they were deployed after launch. You can see the um, antenna. And inside, you can see these four identical uh, cameras. Well, you can't see them because they've got a cover on and a giant baffle. In this image, it's a close-up, and you can see one of the test cameras. The actual aperture is not very big. It's only about 10 centimeters in diameter. And what you can see, that black rib thing, is a giant baffle. And that baffle is designed to block out light from Earth and from the Moon and other things. Now, each of these um, four cameras has a CCD detector at its base, and they're all placed together on a platform, and there's like this sun shield that goes around them. Now, inside the spacecraft, there's the usual uh, spacecraft hardware, like data storage, there's a radio for communications, there's batteries that store up the power from the solar panels. Here are some of the test team members a long time ago. They were fooling around with the camera, one of the test cameras, showing that it actually still worked even at room temperature because these cameras actually are cooled to very cold temperatures. So this is an artist's conception and animation of the test mission in space. And these four cameras actually are aligned in a special way so that they cover a large strip of the sky. Uh, each camera is about 24 by 24 degrees, if that, that means anything to you. And the cameras are made to uh, tile the sky in strips that we call sectors. So each of these sectors uh, is lasts for about a month. And tests job is to tile the sky. TESS has already finished the southern hemisphere and it's nearly finished with the northern hemisphere. So actually TESS observes so many stars it's just unbelievable how many. This is just three quarters of one of the cameras. And this is just like a beauty picture, just to show you how many um, gorgeous stars are out there in the, in the test mission. It's amazing to just wonder, like, how many planets could be out there in the sky, and how many of them tests might be able to find. So TESS is actually searching for planets by the transit technique. This is a very established, very mature method to find planets. You can see on the top is an artist's conception of a star, like our sun, with a planet going in front of it. And the bottom is actually showing you the so-called light curve. It's the star brightness as a function of time. So you can see that when the planet goes in front of the star, the starlight drops by a tiny amount. Actually, it's related to the planet to star area. And when the planet finishes transiting, the star returns to its normal brightness. So I'm actually going to just go back to this other animation for a moment. Because I just wanted to convey to you how many stars TESS is trying to look for um, data. And first of all, TESS has a very unique 13.7 day, highly elliptical, what we call cislunar orbit about Earth. So it's got about 27.4 day observing period per segment. Um, and you can see that at the top, the segments overlap in this so-called continuous, it's not a continuous viewing zone, but it's like this overlapping zone 
and there we can detect planets with much longer periods. Typically, TESS is sensitive to planets with a period of about uh, half a month or so. So out of the whole night sky, out of this whole night sky, TESS is actually monitoring 200,000 stars at a two-minute cadence. But it actually monitors the full-frame image with the data has to be binned on board because the data rate uh, to the Earth can't let us, it's not high enough for us to get all our data down. And then we're looking at millions and millions of stars uh, that are binned to 30 minutes. Um, all right, so our goal is to find transiting planets. And here's that same beauty image with just one star selected for you to see some real data. So again, our goal is to monitor the star brightness as a function of time and to get a time series for all the stars that we can. And that would be 20,000 uh, for every sector, every one month sector, that would be about 20,000 two minute cadence, what we call postage stamp images, and about 1 million 30 minute cadence images. Now what you see in the graph, uh, forget about the y-axis for a moment, the x-axis is time and hours, and you see the star brightness, which are the little blue points, the black points are bin data, and the red is a model fit, the best fit model to the data. And you can see the star brightness with time is more or less constant, and then the brightness drops when the planet transits the star. And we're actually using computers to go through all the data and to automatically look for planets. It's a really big job. Okay, so we actually have sophisticated computer algorithms that do almost all of the work, and these algorithms were developed over many, many years. Uh, they're heritage from NASA's Kepler mission in part, and they're also just code that people have put together and made lots of parts of it freely available. So what these computer algorithms do is they create a time series, um, they clean up the data, they search for transits, that little drop in brightness, and they reject variable stars and binary stars where possible. There's actually a lot of false positives. That's the main problem, is that a lot of things can look like a little drop in brightness. When the computer has done all of this work, then human vetters sort through the rest by visually inspecting the light curves. And at the same time, they look at uh, auxiliary data products. So every sector, we go from millions of stars down to about 100 test objects of interest. Now, I played a big role on the test mission. I was the deputy science director for a number of years. And my job was to set up the team and the process that led to finding these planet candidates. We just call them planet candidates because a lot of work has to be done to actually determine whether a drop in brightness is due to a planet or something else. So once we have a planet candidate, we give it out to the community of astronomers, the test team and, and other people, and their goal is to follow up the planets to look for other signs to make sure it's a, to see if it's a planet or a binary star or another type of false positive. And I won't go through all the details, but I just wanted you to know that there are several different steps and there are several hundred astronomers all around the globe who are helping out with tests. So now I just wanted to take a moment and walk you through a few light curves. And then I'm going to let you try to find some planets yourself. And so what you're seeing in this image here is what we traditionally have the computer make on its own. Once the computer finds an object that it flags, it actually outputs, honestly, it can output like a 30 page or 100 page report for us. But I'm only going to show you the tiniest amount of data because it's all we really have time to go through right now. So on the top here, what you're looking at is the star brightness as a function of time. And the time is listed in days. So it looks like it's um, about a month. So the drop in brightness actually is flagged for you in this case by the computer, by the little triangles at the bottom of the top panel. So here the computer thinks it has seen two, two transits. 
we'd like to see more than one transit, otherwise we don't know if it's a repeating pattern that is a planet going around its star. The bottom plot is a phased light curve, we call it, where the transits are superimposed on each other. The data is so-called bin together, and we can now um, see the transit much more clearly. So what we're looking for when we look for a planet is we're looking for a box shape, we're looking for a small drop in brightness, and we're looking for a flat bottom light curve. The reason we're looking for a box shape is because when a planet goes in front of the star, the planet's very small and moving pretty quickly, and it crosses the limb of the star um, pretty relatively quickly, and so that's why you get a box shape. If it's two stars eclipsing each other, which is one of our most common false positives, in that case, it would be a more slow crossing because the stars eclipsing each other are very big as projected on each other, and it takes a lot longer for the transit to happen. For the flat bottom, same thing. The planet, if it's a planet, will be fully superimposed on the star while it's transiting, whereas for a binary star, the stars will take a long time to, they'll never really flat bottom because as this one star eclipses the other, it's just taking out a differing amount of the background the host, the background star as a function of time. So now I'm going to go through a few of them and you can like take notes or just in your head think, wonder if you think it's a planet or not and then I'll come back again and we'll go through each of them together. So remember you're looking for a box shape, a small drop in brightness, and a flat bottom light curve. Needless to say, this one doesn't have any of those properties. It's a V-shape. It's definitely not a box shape, and it's um, no flat bottom either. Here are two different ones for you to look at. And remember, the blue triangle is what the computer thinks is a transit. Remember what you're looking for. Box shape flat bottom, small drop. It's hard for you to tell what's a small drop. The flux is just what we call the brightness of the star and it's in relative units here. The one on the top and bottom are different in these cases, in this one. Actually, no, sorry. This is uh, the same one on the top and bottom, just zoomed in. So you're here to decide whether you think this is a planet candidate or something else. Alright, so now I'm going to go back to the beginning and I'll walk you through um, what you think these are. This one is not a planet. It is a binary star. And the way we can tell that is because it's got this very V-shaped light curve, and what it means is we must have two very big objects that are eclipsing each other. If you look at the top plot, where the data is not face-folded yet, you can see that each transit, the odd and even transits match, but every other transit um, is a different shape, or a different drop in brightness, rather. And that's because the two stars eclipsing each other are different sizes. Okay, this one is not a... This is actually two different ones. And the blue triangles, again, are where the computer uh, thinks there's a transit. The one on top is some kind of eclipsing binary star. It might even be what we call a contact binary star. The one on the bottom is actually a variable star, probably due to spots. And as the star is slowly rotating, different amounts of brightness of the star are reaching us because there's different amounts of spots covering it. This one is actually a stellar, literally stellar example of a planet. It's actually a pretty big planet. We call it a hot Jupiter. And this one is like just such a classical image of a transit. If you were part of the test team and searching for transits, you would only need to look at this for like a second to know it was a planet <laughs> because it has these very um, box shape, this flat bottom. And again, it's hard for you to tell, but it has, uh, well, it has a relatively small drop in brightness. It's a very clean transit light curve. I hope you can admire it for a moment. This one is a sawtooth pattern. It's got to be some kind of variable star. Even though the computer thought there was a transit here, 
this is definitely not a transit. And in the bottom plot, again, you can see the red line is our best fit model. It's not fitting the data very well, is it? The red line hardly goes through any points. This one's definitely not a, a planet. What about this one? Now, most people I run these slides by who are not trained, at least you weren't trained, you only got a one minute training, they usually think this is a planet. Uh, it's got a small drop in brightness. According to the best fit model, it's a pretty box shape and flat bottom. But in fact, this is not. This one is just some kind of noise. And the way we reach that conclusion is because we see um, before the transit happens and after, like if you look after the transit, the data rises. And so it's just not really following the model. It's not really a great blocking out the light and then the light coming back to normal. Okay, this is our last one. And look at the top panel. It's showing you the blue triangles. Like It looks like every less than a day, actually. So if this is a planet, it's actually orbiting its star incredibly quickly. At the bottom panel, you see, again, the phase-folded plot, or the bin data. And there, it looks pretty nice, actually. And if you thought this one was a planet, you were right. So I'm now going to walk through a few of Tess's discoveries. The planet, we, the one we just looked at, this light curve, belongs to a planet called LHS 3844. This is an, I'm showing you an artist's conception of the planet. We actually have no idea what the planet looks like, honestly. We have that light curve. We have some other data. We don't know a lot about it. We know this planet is about, is 1.3 times the size of Earth. We know it's over two times Earth's mass. Its year, the time it takes to orbit its star, is only 11 hours. Remember all those little blue triangles? Its day side temperature is very, very hot. Actually, astronomers took this object and they followed it up with another telescope called the Spitzer Space Telescope. And Spitzer observes in the infrared. Observed in the infrared. It's no longer operational. But this planet actually has a day side temperature that's incredibly hot. It's nearly 1300 degrees Fahrenheit and that would be about 700 degrees Celsius. This planet actually likely has no atmosphere because the observers monitored the planet as it was orbiting the star and they saw that the day site was the day side of the... they saw that one side of the planet was so hot and the other side was incredibly cold. And for a planet to be very hot on one side and very cold on another, it likely means the planet has no atmosphere. Now, I forgot to mention that planets so close to the star, uh, planets that have a very short period, that their orbit is only 11 hours, by Kepler's third law, they're also orbiting very close to the star. And planets very close to the star over time become what we call tidally locked. Just like the moon shows the same face to Earth at all times, these planets would show the same face to their host star at all times. That means one side is permanently in the day and one side is permanently in the night. Now, if there is any atmosphere, it's most likely that the heat would get circulated around the planet. If, as long as the planet has a thin atmosphere, it should equal out to some degree in most cases. And this planet didn't show that, and that's why we infer it likely has no atmosphere. Another system that is one of our favorites from TESS is called the TOI-270 system. I'm showing you the light curves, the transit light curves in the, in the top right corner. And this is just an artist's conception showing you that it has three planets named TOI-270b, TOI-270c, and TOI-270d. Now each of these planets is not like Earth in any way, and for comparison Earth is shown in the left, top left. But it's a really interesting system for a reason I want to um, explain to you that the inner planet is what we think is a rocky planet, it's just about Earth size, and the outer two planets are what we call mini-Neptunes. It's over two times the size of Earth, between two to, let's say, four times Earth's size. And why these are so interesting is they help frame one of the biggest puzzles we have in exoplanets right now. And that is that these two planets, or that, that is that these so-called mini-Neptunes are incredibly common they are likely the most common type of planet in our galaxy. 
yet there is no solar system counterpart to them. So it turns out that in our solar system, we have the terrestrial planets like Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and we have the so-called giant planets like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. But we don't have anything two to three times the size of Earth. Now these common planets, we actually don't know what they, they're made of. We don't know how they formed. There's a lot of different theories about them. But one thing astronomers have found that might lead to clues to what these mini Neptunes are is the so-called radius valley. If we count up the planets, and don't worry about the y-axis for now, it says number of planets per star, but you can just think of this like a regular histogram. It's the number of planets per star, um, and the x-axis is the planet size. And there's a so-called radius valley in that for small planets that we can detect, about one Earth radius or a little bigger, there's a good number of them. And then there's a good number of planets two to three times the size of Earth, but there's a little bit of a gap in the middle. And astronomers think this is because that the rocky planets, the small planets, that they're sculpted, that over the lifetime of the star, these smaller planets used to be bigger, but over the lifetime of the star they were eroded by the star's wind and high energy particles, and that they actually have kind of been slowly evaporated with time. Whereas the mini Neptunes, they're typically a little farther away from the star and that they've managed to hold on most of what they were born with. So we actually think that if we have planets in the same system that span this radius valley, then in the future when we're able to learn more about the planets, we will actually be able to help solve this puzzle. So the last planet of TESS I will tell you about, it's TOI 700D. And by the way, we get to name the planets. We're not allowed to name them with our dog's name or our husband's or our partner's name. We actually have to give it a catalog name. And so in this case, if it doesn't already have a easy to say or a well-known name, we actually can name it, but we have to name it after our catalog. TOI means test object of interest. And when it becomes a planet, we'll just be calling it test 700D. So the test 700 system has three planets that we know of, and the one we're most interested in is TOI-700D. And TOI-700D is a rocky planet, and it orbits in its star's so-called habitable zone, the zone around the star where the planet is heated to be not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. That is an oversimplification, because we don't know anything about the planet's atmosphere. We don't know about its greenhouse gas power in the atmosphere. We have no idea what the surface temperature is. Nonetheless, it's really, we're trying to count up as many planets as possible in their host star's habitable zone. All right, so. We actually um, count up all our planets by putting them on a graph. And this graph is showing you planet the distance uh, of the actual star from Earth. Uh, the planets, this graph is actually showing you the planet radius as a function of the distance from our Earth in units of parsec. One parsec is about three light years. But what you can see here is that the test planets, which are yellow and orange, are relatively close to Earth, actually. Everything is still incredibly far away, but these planets are much closer than the blue ones, which are found by other tests, are found by uh, other missions other than tests. So TESS is finding a lot of planets. So far, we've found 2,000 planet candidates that we've released to the community to follow up. So this part of the talk now, I'm finished talking about TESS, and now I'm going to move on to talk about what we're going to do with the planets. You can think of TESS as kind of like a legacy catalog. The goal is to find all of the most interesting transiting planets around relatively nearby stars that are bright enough for follow-up observations. And we actually are all eagerly awaiting the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope is six and a half meters in diameter and it will operate at infrared wavelengths. And it will orbit very far away from Earth where it's a quiet, very special environment for astronomy. 
and we sometimes call the TESS mission the finder scope for the James Webb because it's finding all these interesting planets that we're going to follow up. It's not just the James Webb Space Telescope we have to look for, forward to, but we're also trying to <laughs> uh, look, we're also looking forward to other telescopes. For example, the 30 meter telescope and other extremely large ground based telescopes. 30 meters is huge. Just want you to think about that for a moment, how big 30 meters is. And this is an artist's conception of what the TMT would look like. Huge telescope with a giant dome. Each of these telescopes is going to be um, able to follow up the atmospheres of planets, some of the planets that TESS is finding. My favorite next generation telescope is a concept called the Starshade. The Starshade can launch with a telescope. Its, it will, its petals will unfurl from a stowed position and snap into place. The Starshade is a specially shaped giant screen, tens of meters in diameter and it would formation fly tens of thousands of kilometers away from the telescope. They would have to line up incredibly precisely so that the starshade can block out the starlight so we can see planets directly. Starshade is a big ongoing project supported by many different organizations, especially by NASA. Here's myself and a couple of team members with one of the petals. This is a prototype used for manufacturing tolerance verification tests to demonstrate that we could make the petal. Uh, actually, it has to be made to a very special shape in order to block out light from the star, precisely enough for us to discover and follow up Earths. Here's a picture from, this is from a few years ago actually, but it's from the Starshade Lab at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And here you can see different prototype scale versions of the starshade, including the one in the middle that the person is touching. We call it membrane management, how we're going to still unfold all the material that we need to block out starlight and have the starshade be functional. Now, I want to tell you how we're going to study planet atmospheres to solve problems like about the mini Neptune radius valley and how we're going to ultimately search for signs of life on planets far away. Now, I hope you, I'm confident that most of you have seen a rainbow. But what you might not know is that if you could look at the rainbow very closely, you would see pieces of the rainbow missing, some small colors missing. And these, I'm going to show you now a picture of our rainbow. And this actually is our solar spectrum, so it's sunlight is not split up by the rainbow, but by a special instrument inside a telescope called a spectrograph. And what you can see here are all these different black lines. They're like bites taken out of the spectrum, bites taken out of the rainbow. I love this image. Each of these different lines are atoms or molecules, either in Earth's atmosphere, or actually in our, even in our sun's atmosphere called the photosphere. And here, uh, each one of them is different actually. And each one corresponds to each line or a set of lines corresponds to a different atom or molecule. And if you study this subject, some people actually are experts and they know which lines belong to which atoms and molecules. So our goal is to take spectra of atmospheres far away and to identify atoms and molecules in the atmosphere. And in fact, we already do this for, we already actually do observe exoplanet atmospheres, hot giant planets, mostly some mini Neptunes, some cooler planets. We're not able to study objects like TOI 700D yet. So far we can only look at uh, really hot planets. But the future is out there and there are probably hundreds of people working on the topic of exoplanet atmospheres today and we're trying to dream up, um, well we work very hard on studying exoplanet atmospheres of the hot Jupiters or mini Neptunes today using Hubble Space Telescope primarily but also ground-based telescopes and the methods and the atmospheres and the details and the physics and chemistry and computer algorithms including some machine learning including a lot of Monte Carlo methods it's very complex but this field is maturing rapidly and more and more people can enter the field by using 
open source codes that are designed for you literally almost just to plug and play, although it takes more effort to understand the physics and chemistry behind the code. So it's going to be a great future for us. So spectra are required to identify a planet as Earth-like in the future, using the large telescopes that I showed you. For example, Earth and Venus are about the same, same size and mass. Venus is sometimes called our sister planet. But one planet, that's Earth of course, has life, and the other, that's Venus, is completely inhospitable to life as we know it. The surface temperature on Venus is so hot, it's hot enough to melt lead. In exoplanets, we ultimately aim to identify gases that might be produced by life, so-called biosignature gases, such, such as oxygen or methane or other gases. In fact, my team works on, literally, the search for life by way of biosignature gases. We're trying to ask the question, what gases should be produced by life on an exoplanet very different from Earth's? Well, we're asking that question. We're trying to answer it. And this image, or this artist's conception, is showing you thousands of molecules in the background. Life on Earth actually produces so many molecules, thousands and thousands of different molecules, as byproducts of their metabolism. Even us humans, we're breathing out carbon dioxide. Cows and such release methane. There's ultimately lots of gases when you walk through a pine forest, all those beautiful smells. You can think of that, those as biosignature gases. The mold in your fridge, or if you have a compost and it smells so bad, those are biosignature gases as well. And so this image is showing you that there are thousands of molecules, but only a set of them can make through the filters that are required, such as they have to be able to, enough of them have to be produced to accumulate in the planet's atmosphere. The planet uh, must, let's say, cooperate in some way, in that many molecules produced by life are very fragile, and they're destroyed by the starlight, by photochemistry. And in this image here, it's showing you three streams. One stream, the molecules probably are not made by life anywhere. One is of these streams are molecules made by life on Earth, and another um, are ones that we hope we can detect, although we're not sure if life on Earth makes them. So to summarize, Exoplanets are planets orbiting stars other than the Sun. Our first generation search for habitable worlds is using TESS. And there's a few other ground-based telescopes that supplement TESS. We're searching for so rocky planets transiting small red dwarf stars. Now, we're doing that because it's easier to find small planets transiting small stars than small trans planets transiting big stars which have a much weaker signal. I spent time telling you about the TESS mission. The TESS legacy is a catalog of exoplanets, will be a catalog for exoplanets for follow-up with next generation telescopes. And I also showed you, told you about some interesting planets TESS is finding in its own right. Astronomers know how to find planets, we're good at that now, and we will spend the next generations searching for signs of life on planets by way of atmosphere biosignature gases. Now one thing I forgot to highlight about TESS is it's relying on transiting planets, that is planets that go in front of their star as seen from the telescope. But we actually, we astronomers, um, well we know that these transiting planets are in fact quite rare because the planet star system has to be very specially aligned. But there are all kinds of planets out there, there are the new generation of telescopes will be able to find planets that are not transiting, and so the future is really tremendous for us in exoplanets. I just wanted to close with uh, a couple more things. One is you can uh, pause on this slide if you want to know more about TESS. There's a lot of resources out there for you to stay up to date with the latest discoveries. And finally, I wanted to convey to you the sentiment I have that I hope that um, you all might share with me. And that is that, you know, someday we'd like to be able to go to a dark sky with our children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews or, or friends and relatives and we'd like to be able to point to a star, a sun-like star, and to be able to tell them that star has a planet like Earth. That concludes my talk and if you have any questions about exoplanets just Google for them. You'll see there's a tremendous amount of material on the web 
You can join planet hunters and find planets on your own. And the next time you're out looking at the night sky, it doesn't even have to be a dark sky filled with stars. It could be in the city, you can always see at least a few stars. I want you to go out there and think about the point that there are so many planets out there, the star you're looking at surely has a planetary system. When I do that, I love to imagine that there's a planet around there with life, looking back at our sun, a star for them, wondering the same thing. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is David J. Lockett. I'm a 2020-21 Albert Einstein Fellow sponsored by the NASA Office of STEM Engagement. Space science is for everyone. My goal is to create and use accessible resources in educational settings.